Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2014 Voices from the Field Leadership Series. My name is Leo Grimaldi, and I am an MPH student here, majoring in Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health, a member of the Student Leadership Circle, and the current Vice President of the Harvard Students in Latino Public Health as well. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Ron Pollack. Ron Pollack is the founding executive director of Families USA, a national organization for healthcare consumers. Families USA's mission is to achieve high quality, affordable health coverage for everyone in the United States. He's also the founding board chairman of Enroll America, an organization composed of very diverse stakeholders working together to secure optimal enrollment of uninsured people through effective implementation of the Affordable Care Act. As well, Mr. Pollock was the founding executive director of the Food Research and Action Center, FRAC, a leading national organization focused on eliminating hunger in the U.S. In 1997, Mr. Pollock was appointed by President Clinton as the sole consumer representative on the Presidential Advisory Commissioner on Consumer Protection and Quality in the Healthcare Industry. Mr. Pollock's work has been recognized through various honors. The Hill, a weekly newspaper covering the Congress and their staff, named Mr. Pollock one of the nine top nonprofit lobbyists. Modern Healthcare named Mr. Pollock one of the hundred most powerful men in healthcare. A National Journal named him one of the top 25 players in the Congress, the administration, and the lobbying community on Medicare prescription drug benefits. Mr. Pollock received his law degree from New York University, where he was an Arthur Garfield Hayes Civil Liberties Fellow. Prior to his current position at Families USA, Mr. Pollock was the Dean of the Antioch School of Law. Before I turn the session over to Professor John McDonough, who will be moderating today, please join me in welcoming Mr. Ron Pollock to HSPH and the Voices from the Field Leadership Series. So thank you for that introduction and welcome to all of you and welcome to everybody who is watching. It is a real honor and privilege to have Ron Pollock, the Executive Director of Families USA, who is one of the most important figures in the history of healthcare justice in the United States. I need to make a full disclosure. I'm a member of the board of Families USA. That's not a conflict of interest. That's an honor, but everybody should know. And I'd like to start just by asking Ron, welcome, to talk a little bit personally. So you've been part of the health justice movement for decades, but you were also part of the hunger movement, the civil rights movement. Can you talk about your life in social justice and a little bit of your career and some of the key moments and points and what you've learned from all of this lifelong experience in fighting for justice? What John didn't say is my boss because he's on the board uh, of Families USA, so I've got to behave myself. Um, I, I would say that uh, my involvement in social justice really started in college. Um, uh, I, was, I was student body president and I was involved in the recruitment of students for what was known as uh, Mississippi Summer of 1964. And uh, one of the students who was recruited uh, from our campus as a result was a fellow named Andy Goodman. Uh, and Andy, together with uh, James Cheney and Michael Schwerner, uh, were three of the people who were killed in Mississippi in the summer of 64. And Mickey Schwerner also had a connection to the school because his brother taught at the school. And so I got very deeply involved in uh, the civil rights movement, uh, and I had decided I wanted to go to Mississippi uh, and I spent uh, a significant period of time in Mississippi, living in the Mississippi Delta, uh, doing a lot of the work of the civil rights movement. And it was there, frankly, that I, I, I as a middle class uh, kid, I really was exposed to things I'd never seen before. Hunger, uh, uh, incredible poverty, people without health coverage, and and, 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 and the image that I keep in my mind is uh, going to a, a shack on a plantation near 
then uh, Senator James Eastland's plantation, uh, and there was a, a young child about seven years of age with a distended belly and uh, clearly had uh, major malnutrition. And uh, I remember I, w I, was, I, was, I went to the shack with uh, an organizer from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and, uh, and he went to what was, they didn't have a refrigerator, had an ice box, and, and there was just no food uh, anywhere in the house. And this child had sores all over his body, uh, and there were flies all over him, and, and the child had no, a, no energy whatsoever. And it left a real lasting impression upon me. And, so I got deeply involved as I was in the, when I was working the civil rights movement on the questions of hunger in the United States. Um, and when I graduated law school, uh, one of the first things I did, actually months after I graduated law school, we filed 26 lawsuits on the same day, um, all against the U.S. Department of Agriculture and uh, also against the states. There were, at that time, over a thousand counties in the country out of over 3,000 that had no food assistance program, no food stamp program, no commodity distribution program. And we brought litigation to uh, make sure that there'd be a food assistance program. And we actually won the litigation. It's a long story, but uh, it actually led to there now being a food stamp program in every county in the country. And uh, we went on to do work that actually started the WIC program, uh, the Women, Infants, and Children. Um, and, uh, and it turns out that after doing this work for a little bit of time, this was during the War on Poverty days, I got a phone call one day from somebody I didn't know who said, um, we have some extra money. Would you be willing to hold a conference for lawyers about how you can deal with hunger? And I said I'd get back to him, and I thought a bit of, uh, about it. And I got back to him, and I said, I, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, if you have money, let's not do a one-shot deal. Let's create something that can do, be an ongoing operation. And that started this group called FRAC, Food Research Action Center, which I started and ran for 10 years. Um, and we did a lot of work relative to uh, improving the food stamp program, making sure that school lunch program was uh, operational in low-income schools and establishing school breakfast program, expanding the WIC program. Uh, and, and then there was a brief interlude. Um, uh, there was an opening uh, to be uh, the dean of the Antioch School of Law. And Antioch was a public interest uh, law school uh, where, which had the most intensive clinical program in the country. And I thought, this is great. We, you know, we didn't, the students got their learning by actually practicing law, and I thought this would be really exciting. I did that for a few years, and, and then uh, purely by serendipity, uh, Phil and Kate Villers, who live in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, uh, said they wanted to start a new organization, and um, uh, he was going to contribute $40 million to it, and that ultimately became Families USA. So uh, it, it was all serendipity. And so Families USA is a consumer health advocacy organization for the nation. I think a lot of people are confused by what does an advocate do? And what is Families USA? And what role does it play? And how have you shaped it and changed it over now about 25 years? So, a little over 30. Over 30 years, forgive me. Um, <laughs> So uh, fam we, we fashion ourselves as being a voice for healthcare consumers. Um, what, what, I would say that our bottom line mission, this would be an admission here of, of, of some sort, um, I, most of the folks at Families USA, myself included, did not come to the organization because of some real intense interest about healthcare. I would say for myself, and it's true, I think, for most of the people on the staff, I think we cared most deeply about distributive justice. And healthcare is clearly as significant an arena about distributive justice, such big differences about um, those who have and those who uh, don't have. 
And so uh, predominantly our, in, our focus, at least in the first uh, two, two and a half decades, has been on trying to expand health coverage for people who are uninsured and underinsured. So when you ask about advocacy, advocacy has many different elements to it, as you know. Uh, it includes doing policy analyses, doing a lot of work in, uh, in the media and trying to get your point across or your, your point of view across. Uh, it includes lobbying, it includes working with grassroots organizations across the country who are like-minded so that they're strong and they can uh, undertake advocacy at the state and local level and combine on federal efforts. So uh, we, we try and do as many things to push uh, public policy and our primary focus has been on expanding coverage for the uninsured and underinsured. So you say distributive justice. I think a lot of people today, when they use that term, they use the word inequality. Is it the same thing? How do you, how do you define distributive justice and what you're... Well, distributive justice, in, in, in my mind, is, is the huge disparities that exist. You know, here we are, the richest country in the history of the world, and yet we have, you know, tens of millions of people who, uh, under any reasonable um, uh, basis would, are considered to have difficulties getting the, uh, you know, the necessities of life, whether it's health care, whether it's food, whether it's housing. And so distributive justice to me is to try to correct that and, and, and reduce some of these enormous inequities. So right after the Affordable Care Act was signed in 2010 by President Obama, Senator Baucus, Max Baucus, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, came out and called the ACA one of the largest laws ever for redistribution of income. And then he very quickly pulled back and said, no, I really didn't mean that. But is the ACA part of distributive justice? Oh, I think so. Uh, you know, their last Census Bureau report said that there are 48 million people who are uninsured, and uh, which, which almost nobody can sort of put their hands on. What does 48 million mean? It's such an extraordinarily large number. I mean, it's larger than the aggregate population of 24 states plus the District of Columbia. And the Affordable Care Act offers a hope that we are actually going to reach many of those 48 million. It does not include uh, coverage for those people who are not legally in the country. But for everyone else, the Affordable Care Act provides a real opportunity to extend coverage. And now the job is to make real what the legislative uh, legislation promises. So one group recently sponsored a web debate and the question on the floor was, is the Affordable Care Act already dead? And so let me ask you to sort of ponder, where are we at with the ACA or Obamacare now? How are we doing, and what do you see ahead? Well, obviously, the Affordable Care Act uh, had a rocky beginning uh, with, you know, with the uh, website malfunctioning. But uh, this, is, this is not a short-term uh, effort in, in terms of making sure that the Affordable Care Act becomes a living reality for families. And uh, so I would say um, a couple of things. One is uh, a key task for all of us is to make sure that the many people who are uninsured who can gain benefits from the Affordable Care Act, either through the expansion of the Medicaid program, uh, half the states now have agreed to expand the Medicaid program, um, uh, or through uh, huge tax credit premium subsidies for people uh, below 400 percent of poverty. And mind you, most people who are eligible for these benefits at this juncture still are unaware of them. You know, they've heard this vituperative debate about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that's been mainly a political debate, but so far it's really not reached a, a personal understanding for people. So right now, our job is to make sure that people get enrolled. Now, that not, not only helps significant numbers of people, but it also uh, increases the stability, political stability, of the Affordable Care Act. Because it's one thing 
to withhold something that someone never had before. It's another thing to take something away that people have received. And as millions of people get enrolled, uh, I think it, it provides stability for the Affordable Care Act. I, I do not think that uh, the Affordable Care Act is anything other than a pretty permanent institution. It will be changed in some ways. It will be modified. I'd like to see it modified in a variety of ways. But I don't think there's uh, going to be any successful effort to repeal or undermine uh, the Affordable Care Act. Our job now is to make it work as potentially it could work. Mm -hmm. So let me ask one more question and then we will open it up to folks in the audience. So if you could change whatever you thought most needed changing in the Affordable Care Act, what would be up on the top of your list? Well, despite the fact that the Affordable Care Act provides much greater opportunities for people to afford premiums, and um, there's still going to be, I think, a lot of people who find that uh, their uh, premium and their out-of-pocket costs when they get care uh, is out of reach. And so I think uh, one of the next generation of changes in the Affordable Care Act probably won't happen this year or the next Congress. But I could see in, in, in the, uh, sometime in the future, uh, we're going to have to make some improvements. We're going to have to take a look at how do, do these subsidies actually deliver a, an affordable opportunity to get coverage and to get care. And I think we're going to find that it's, uh, there are significant improvements can be made and should be made. Uh, I think the bigger challenge, ultimately, that organizations that care about um, uh, where we're going as a health care system and where groups like Families USA are now transitioning to uh, is to deal with the confluence of health care costs and quality. Uh, if we don't do that, then I think even the gains of the Affordable Care Act are, are going to be undermined. Okay. So let's open up to the audience. Is there anyone who would like to start us off? with a compelling question. Or non-compelling question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Jennifer Atlas. I'm a second year student in health policy and management. Um, I'm someone who prior to HSPH did a lot of work with undocumented immigrants and healthcare access. And as you mentioned, that was one of the groups that was left out of health reform. I was curious about what you see for the future of that group. Is that something that's likely to change in the next decade, two decades, um, especially with more discourse around immigration reform? Is that something that you think will come up again? Uh, are advocacy, advocacy groups still fighting for uh, undocumented immigrants in Washington, or is it off the radar for now? Great question. Um, I, you know, I would say that uh, with respect to this population, the number one uh, job right now is will be immigration reform, and uh, and I think there are some reasonable opportunities that there'll be some significant immigration reform. Whether it leads to actual citizenship, I'm I'm uncertain. Clear that House Republicans are not exactly eager uh, for that. Um, but I, but I think f job one is to give people a sense of security that they can stay in the country, that they can get a job, that they won't be exploited when they're on the job. Uh, for those people who get the job, they may have the opportunity of having employer-sponsored health insurance. And so even though the Affordable Care Act does not provide subsidies uh, for people so that they can uh, better afford health care coverage, uh, for immigrants who now have the security if, if meaningful immigration reform happens uh, and they can get decent jobs, I think that will make a significant uh, uh, improvement. Now, beyond that, for those people who don't get coverage that way, I, I, I don't think we're going to see immediate progress at the federal level with respect to changing the Affordable Care Act's provisions for people who are, not, who are not legally in the country. Now, what happens when they are legally in the country, they have a green card or 
I, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I do think we're going to see some improvements at the state level. California, I think, is likely to lead the way on this. Uh, California is thinking about providing a variety of different mechanisms so that people can get coverage, but it probably won't be with federal funds. So, so the Affordable Care Act represented no progress for undocumented immigrants. And it also, at the same time, represented an enormous progress for immigrants who are here legally. Do you expect that health is going to become an issue in the immigration reform debate and that the folks who are able to get the advantages of immigration reform will also be able to get health benefits under the ACA? Do you expect to fight over that? What do you, what do you see ahead in the, in the near term on that? I think the political issue, at least for the next uh, couple of years, is really going to be on immigration reform as opposed to uh, amending the Affordable Care Act. And it's, it's a major task, and it's unclear whether we're going to succeed in, in, in there being significant immigration uh, reform. Uh, and I, and it's, so, it's so essential because if you don't have it, then uh, th then you're going to have a population that's constantly exploited, that works hard, uh, does all the right things, but because they don't have the legal status of protection, they're always living under the shadow. Uh, I think that's job one, and I think if, if, if Congress succeeds in passing meaningful legislation, uh, I, I, I think that's what uh, the, the key immigration uh, organizations have been pushing for. Uh, I, I, I don't see the Affordable Care Act being changed meaningfully in, in the short term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Hang on. The mic behind you. Hi. My name is uh, Daniel Raz. I'm a Master's of Public Health uh, student here. And before I was here, um, I was a primary care doctor at a community health center. And a lot of the issues that my patients came in and talked to me about, you know, were related to their access to, to health services, but also uh, more upstream factors uh, with respect to health, so things like income security, access to good housing. And so my question to you is, do you think con um, consumer health advocacy groups like Families USA can bring a health language um, to some of these upstream factors? And the example I'm thinking of specifically is the debate that's emerging around minimum wage. And if you, you, know, if you think there's a role for a language of health and income security in that discussion. You know, for, for people who are uninsured right now, um, I would say there are two top priorities that relate to uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, um, you know, one is we've got in 25 states across the country, we still don't do anything for the lowest income folks um, because the Supreme Court changed the Affordable Care Act's provisions relative to the Medicaid expansion. And that's a big, big uh, uh, ongoing fight. If you look at the uh, uh, states that, uh, from Texas all the way through Virginia, not a single one of those states uh, has expanded the Medicaid program. And so you've got, ironically, a very the, the poorest folks are left out in the cold in terms of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, you've got uh, in 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 California, in, in, I'm sorry, in Texas right now, the eligibility standard for getting Medicaid coverage is 18 percent of the federal poverty level for parents. Uh, in 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 states like Alabama, it's it's less than one quarter of the poverty level. Even in states like Pennsylvania, which you would think is a more liberal state, uh, it's only one-third of the federal poverty level for parents. Uh, and for non-parental adults, singles and childless couples, in, uh, in all of the states that have refused to implement the Medicaid expansion, uh, if you're single or in a, child, you're a childless couple, you're ineligible for uh, the Medicaid program, irrespective of income. So I would say, in terms of um, you know the broader issues of distributive justice, we've got so much to do just in terms of the Affordable Care Act to reach this very poor population. Um, 
So in, in, ironically, in Take Texas, I, I mentioned their eligibility standard for parents uh, maxes out at 18% of the federal poverty level. So for parents between 18% of poverty and the poverty level, there's nothing for them under the Affordable Care Act. It's only one for those families with incomes above the poverty level, up to 400% of poverty, that they get a significant benefit. So we've got so much to do in health care. Um, you know, the, uh, the minimum wage fight will continue to be fought. I don't know what's going to happen in Washington. I'm not overly optimistic about Congress uh, increasing the minimum wage. I do think we're going to see significant changes at the state and local level. Uh, I think that's where the battles are going to be won with respect to the minimum wage. So let me ask you to go out on a limb. So right now 25 states are part of the Medicaid expansion plus the District of Columbia. So by 2019, how many states would you predict will be part of the Medicaid expansion? All of them. All of them. 50 uh, out of 50 within five years. Uh, yeah, I do mm -hmm. think, you, you know, when the Medicaid what program... What makes you so optimistic? A number of reasons. Um, number one, when the Medicaid program uh, began in 1965, it wasn't a mandatory program, and a number of states held out. Arizona held out the longest. Ultimately, they all came in. Uh, but there's something really different about the way the Affordable Care Act structures the Medicaid expansion, even with the Supreme Court's decision that's, I th that gives lots of reason for optimism. Um, most significantly is the funding level for the expansion. In the first three years, 2014, 15, and 16, it's 100 percent of the expansion. Thereafter, it diminishes somewhat. In 2017, it's 95 percent, but it never goes below 90 percent. The, aver the, the median um, uh, reimbursement rate of the federal government for the uh, Medicaid program has been about 56 percent, 56 percent paid by the federal government, 44 percent uh, paid by the states. So this is a bargain, you know, that even at 90 percent. So that's one factor. Secondly, um, you know, uh, how does a governor uh, say uh, to his or her constituents, you know, we in Texas are going to uh, send our tax money to Washington so it can be used in California and Arizona and uh, Illinois and New York, uh, but it's not going to come back to uh, people in our, our own state. I think ultimately that's not a tenable uh, political position. But there are also other reasons. Um, for state budgets, this is very helpful because states spend some money on uncompensated care, particularly for people going to emergency rooms and public hospitals. And as more and more people get insured, states are going to save those expenditures. And over and above that, uh, this big influx of federal dollars has a profound impact on employment and what it does in terms of the economy of the state. There are a number of uh, state-specific analyses about it. So I think you put all those things together, uh, uh, there's reason for optimism. One other factor, and, and that is the reason the states have opposed uh, the Medicaid expansion so far is, uh, is, is, is so uh, really rooted in partisan politics and antipathy to President Obama. Uh, and I think that over time, that is going to diminish. Uh, and, uh, and as other states, you know, you've, you've got eight Republican governors that now have the Medicaid expansion uh, that got it through. Uh, governors of Arizona, New Jersey, uh, Ohio, et cetera, that, you know, fairly conservative governors. And they think it's the right thing to do. I think that's going to lead the way. Okay. Who's next? Hi, my name is Charlene Palmer. I'm a volunteer with Healthcare for All and also an employee with the Brigham Women's Hospital's Trauma and Burn Program. And I have a question um, based on some of the earlier comments you made about how you got into advocacy for consumers. Um, you talked about the food stamp program. 
And I was curious as to your take on um, the bill that's in Congress now that's um, talking about cutting such a huge amount from the food stamp program and how that relates to food insecurity and health. So the bill that is now in the Senate has passed the House uh, would cut the food stamp program by between eight and nine billion dollars over the next ten years. Um, and the House passed bill uh, would have cut the food stamp program by forty billion dollars. Uh, and so, uh, um, you, you know, if you take a look at, at, at how the House and the Senate uh, uh, moved into conference committee, um, the reduction was significantly diminished. Now, the organization I started years ago, FRAC, Food Research Action Center, I still serve on the executive committee. Uh, FRAC uh, actually uh, has expressed uh, its, its view that uh, the bill should not pass, but it will pass. Uh, it it, it, it uh, made a very, there was a significant vote yesterday that showed that uh, uh, it's going to be impossible to filibuster the legislation. Um, so I'm sorry that there are cutbacks in the food stamp program, uh, um, but I'm also pleased at the same time that the huge cutbacks that were in the House bill have been derailed. And um, it, it, it's, it's not a good movement, I think, to cut food stamps, which are, you know, they don't provide nutritionally adequate diets, you know, with the food stamp allotment. But uh, I'm grateful that in this really bad political context that the cuts were minimized. So let me just refer to a prior question. So as, as the leader of a major advocacy organization in Washington, D.C., every day you must get tugged to get involved in a hundred issues that are not central to Families USA and yet like food stamps or minimum wage are quite compelling in terms of the justice motivation behind the organization. How do you deal with that? How do you decide? How do you make that decision and do you have a way to do it without people being furious at you because you're not signing up for everybody's cause? Well, it's really important to figure out what can you do, and if you know if you spread yourself too thin, you're not going to accomplish anything. And we constantly struggle with, even in the healthcare area, and uh, what are the things that we should focus on, and um, and and they are very tough choices. And I tend to lean. Well, I want to do this. I want to do that. But. Uh, uh, the st staff has been fairly disciplined in, in saying, um, this is, a, you know, what are the priorities? What is it going to take for the staff to have some impact on those? And so, sure, there are temptations to go well beyond our, uh, our agenda, but um, I, I, I think we've learned over the years that if you spread yourself too thin, you're not going to accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Yes. Um, my name is Elizabeth Anderson. I'm in my first of two years in the Health Policy Management Department. And I was wondering, you mentioned at the beginning about um, the issues with the website, with the rollout, um, the ACA. And I was just sort of wondering, positive or negative, any lessons you think future public health leaders could learn from these first few months of the rollout? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, passing a law is insufficient. <clears throat> passing a law is critically important, but then you have to implement it uh, effectively. Uh, and obviously, um, uh, you know, a good number of us were tremendously surprised to our uh, great unhappiness about how the rollout uh, began in October. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the lessons I think to be learned for uh, anyone who does advocacy work is there are no such things as, as final victories and final defeats. And, uh, and in the context of the Affordable Care Act, there isn't, there hasn't, there isn't a final victory. We have got to make sure that it gets implemented effectively. And obviously, a lot of us were taken by surprise by how the, uh, how the uh, healthcare.gov malfunctioned. And I have to say, since I spend a fair amount of time with people in the White House and Department of Health and Human Services 
truly at the highest levels, I, they were surprised. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the testing had not been done adequately, uh, and, uh, and, it, and, and, it, and it has caused a problem in a, in a variety of, of ways. It, uh, it means that in the first enrollment period, which began October 1, ends uh, March 31, we may not actually reach as many people as we should have had, uh, had the website functioned properly. The Congressional Budget Office today released a report where they reduced their estimate of how many people are going to get uh, enrolled in the first enrollment period. I think that's, uh, that's tragic. I think also for those people who um, potentially can benefit from the Affordable Care Act, when you hear negative things about the Affordable Care Act, even if it's not intrinsic to the actual legislation itself, it might deter a good number of people to think there's something there for me uh, under the Affordable Care Act. So it has made our job a whole lot more difficult in terms of getting people enrolled. Um, the way we're trying to respond to that uh, and the way I think we can most profoundly influence the way people think about the Affordable Care Act and whether they might want to get enrolled is by telling the stories of people who've gotten enrolled. There is nothing more effective in terms of reaching uh, moderate lower income uh, population groups that can benefit from the Affordable Care Act than seeing somebody who's similarly situated, who's gotten enrolled and is happy with it and they can start saying, well, maybe there's something there for me as well. But there's no question that uh, that first couple of months in particular was a real setback. So part of what's been interesting about the Affordable Care Act process, passage and implementation, has been the involvement of another movement in this space. So not just the health justice movement, but the Tea Party movement has had a significant impact on the process of passage and implementation. What impact do you think they have? How do you evaluate their impact? And how do you understand and assess that movement? Well, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't just focus on what they did after the enactment. Uh, they, uh, they had a significant impact during the pendency of the Affordable Care Act. And as you remember well, um, there was a chance, we thought at one point, that this could be a bipartisan piece of legislation. And Max Baucus, uh, tried really hard uh, to achieve bipartisanship, and he was uh, working with three Republicans, uh, most uh, predominantly through uh, uh, Chuck Grassley of Iowa. And because of the tremendous uh, uh, criticism that occurred about the Affordable Care Act from Tea Party groups in the summer of 2009, I think it really made it virtually impossible for Republicans to feel comfortable coming on board. And yes, there were policy differences, but I think the politics had shifted. And, and I remember uh, Chuck Grassley, who we had invited Chuck Grassley to our annual meeting uh, uh, that year. And, uh, and, and we were eager to, to try to you know, involve him as much as possible in the crafting of the legislation. and. Um, he was the uh, ranking minority member of the Senate Finance Committee. But when the Tea Party folks really started uh, revolting, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in the summer of 2009, it made it very difficult, if not impossible, for Republicans to sign on board. And we wound up never getting a single Republican in the House or the Senate cooperating or voting for uh, the legislation. Uh, so I think they did have that impact. Uh, there's no question that they have made the Affordable Care Act their key battle cry as to why uh, President Obama should not be reelected and why Democrats should not be reelected. Uh, and it has become a cause celebre in, in, in the, in, in, among conservative groups. And I think it, is, it has caused some real problems. Not in, the sense, not in the sense that this legislation is going to be repealed. It will not be repealed. You know, we've had 40 plus attempts in the House 
to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it's not going to be repealed. But what it has done is I think it has influenced people's views about the Affordable Care Act. When you get um, uh, polling numbers about whether people think the Affordable Care Act is good or bad, um, it's, it's, it's very mixed with um, uh, more saying they, they're not, they don't like it, even though they like the underlying provisions of the Affordable Care Act. And I think as a result, it makes it tougher for us to get people enrolled because somehow they've heard the Affordable Care Act is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Tiffany Kennison. I'm a master's of public health student in health policy and management. Um, so my question is really related more to post ACA because I agree, I don't think it's going to be repealed. I think ultimately with some effort, um, it can be implemented. Um, but the Oregon Medicaid experiment showed that there was limited um, health benefits to Medicaid for those who were um, at, who, for those who were in Oregon. Um, and I kind of wonder um, what are the next steps to really making sure that health outcomes for low-income Americans are improved um, overall. Well, you refer to the Oregon uh, um, uh, t testing that that's been made that that that's very significant, and there'll be. Um, new iterations of, of this Oregon uh, uh, testing. Um, I, I, would not, I would not characterize even the latest report about um, what the benefits or, or, or lack of benefits are in the Medicaid program as showing that uh, it, is not, it is not a significant improvement for people to get Medicaid coverage. I think the key headline there was that uh, people, when they get Medicaid, as opposed to being uninsured, actually increase their visits to emergency rooms, uh, and uh, that was that was thought. Well, you know, maybe maybe we aren't really changing much in terms of how people gain access to to health coverage. I, I, I what 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 that study also shows is that when people get a uh, Medicaid card and are eligible for Medicaid, it increases the likelihood of them getting care in a variety of different settings, including emergency rooms. I think, it, uh, I think ultimately we're going to see that those people who were uninsured, who now have health coverage, that it has a significant impact in terms of their access to health care. I, you know, over the many years that we've been uh, doing this work, I've seen so many people who are uninsured. And I would say the common thing that occurs uh, among people who are uninsured is they defer care. Uh, at the onset of a disease, at the onset of pain, uh, they decide that you know, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't go to the doctor. Uh, and clearly, uh, m most don't get preventive care. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is going to change. Uh, and uh, so I do think there is a huge difference in terms of people getting covered, uh, in including getting covered through the Medicaid program. But, uh, you know, the next steps are going to be uh, how do we make um, coverage more affordable for those people marginally above the Medicaid level? Um, because I think we are going to find that there are millions of people who, despite the subsidies, are still finding coverage unaffordable. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Sonali Saluja, and I'm a first-year uh, uh, MPH student here. Um, and I'm also a primary care physician, and I worked in Oregon and in Massachusetts uh, recently. Um, and I found that people really struggle with paying for their medications. And I constantly see people, even people with insurance, who've fallen into the donut hole or the cost is being passed on to them through their premiums, higher co-pays, or even you know, us taxpayers are, are, are bearing the burden of the cost of medications. And I don't know how much the ACA is doing to address that. So um, as a consumer advocate, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are and how we're going to go forward and address that issue. So you refer to the donut hole. Um, of course, that's a, a major gap in, in uh, prescription drug coverage under the Medicare program. Um, what the Affordable Care Act does, 
that hasn't gotten quite as much attention is that it ultimately closes the donut hole. Um, right now, uh, people who fall in that gap in coverage are now getting discounts in terms of their brand name drugs. Those discounts cover o over half, about half of the cost of brand name drugs. Over time, by 2020, the donut hole is going to be totally eliminated. So I think it is going to make a significant difference uh, just in terms of the, s the population that's on Medicare. Uh, with respect to others, we, we're already seeing an enormous movement away from brand name drugs to generic drugs. Uh, in, in Medicaid, uh, I, I forgot the exact percentage, but over three quarters of the drugs purchased by Medicaid beneficiaries are now generic drugs. And, um, and so I, there is clearly a great deal of cost consciousness, and I think we're going to continue to see that development that will make drugs more, uh, more affordable than if people continued with brand name drugs. So one of the criticisms of the Affordable Care Act is that it doesn't do anything to control the rising rate of health care costs. Is that a fair accusation? And where do you see the cost and quality conversation going forward from here? Well, I don't think that's a fair comment about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, however, I would also say, just to balance the response, is that the Affordable Care Act could only do a limited number of things on costs and still pass. Uh, remember, we needed 60 votes in the United States Senate. Guess how many votes we got? We got 60 votes. We needed 218 votes in the House of Representatives. We got 219 votes in the House of Representatives. Now, we had a number of uh, key health care groups from the hospitals, the physicians, even the pharmaceutical companies uh, that supported improving access to coverage. Had the Affordable Care Act gone more deeply into costs, I think we would have not only lost that support from those key groups, but we would have gotten active opposition. So. I, I, I think it's inappropriate to say it hasn't done anything with respect to cost. I think it is making some changes. I think it's moving us away from a fee-for-service system, which I think is very important. Uh, I, I think we're, we're going to be moving closer to transparency of cost. It is improving opportunities for patient-centered outcomes research to, to be undertaken. Those are all very important things, and I think they are having an effect uh, uh, with respect to cost. Is there much more we can do? Of course there is. And I think the next generation of legislation, which I hope will be done more in a bipartisan way, uh, because uh, businesses care deeply about it, and I think Republicans uh, care deeply about it, is I think we are going to go much deeper and much more comprehensively on, on the confluence of costs and quality. Mm -hmm. okay. Others? So let me ask, since everybody's quiet all of a sudden, um, the, um, this past week, three Republican senators, Senators Coburn, Burr, and Hatch, came out with a repeal and replacement legislative proposal in the Senate. Have you looked at it? What do you think of it? What do you think is going to happen? Why are they doing it? Is there an underlying strategy that is maybe not apparent to people just following this through the newspapers? Well, uh, there, there's been a significant debate within the Republican Party about uh, what to do about the Affordable Care Act. The, the, the battle cry has been repeal and replace, and we've seen repeal and repeal and repeal, and not much in terms of replace. And there's a big battle within the Republican Party. I, I like to say the right hand often doesn't know what the far right hand is doing. <laughs> uh, and um, I, 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 think it's, I, I think it is yet unclear uh, whether there's going to be any significant attempt, let alone success, in uh, significantly modifying the Affordable Care Act. I, I think the uh, Hatch Coburn Burr bill is not going to, it's not even going to come up for a vote in the Senate. And uh, the leadership in the House 
is not too eager about that legislation. Uh, and, 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 and the key political debate within the Republican Party in the House is should we have a debate about some replacement uh, or should we just really continue to criticize the Affordable Care Act and not offer an alternative where we're setting ourselves up for people criticizing the legislation? Um, as of now, it looks like the, there is going to be some uh, replace bill offered in the House. Um, uh, Eric Kanner has indicated that uh, uh, they are going to introduce a bill. But it's interesting, many of the key aspects of the Affordable Care Act they're going to retain. Uh, they're, you know, the, some of the popular things about young adults being able to stay on their parents' policy up to age 26, that'll stay. Uh, protecting people who've got pre-existing health conditions, that's going to stay. Uh, limiting uh, any, uh, stopping insurers from uh, placing arbitrary caps on lifetime uh, um, uh, payments for, uh, I think those kinds of things are going to stay. I think the real question ultimately is what do you do about the subsidies? What do you do about employer-sponsored health insurance? Um, Hatch, Co uh, Coburn, and, and Burr are talking about limiting uh, the tax benefit that is received for employer-sponsored insurance, which is mighty unpopular. Um, um, I, I, my guess is we're not going to see anything other than perhaps some votes on the House floor, but the legislation won't go further. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Meanwhile, on the, on the Democratic side, we're seeing a wave of retirements of people who were real champions of the ACA. Senator Baucus is leaving to become ambassador to China. Senator Harkin is stepping down at the end of his term. Senate Representative Henry Waxman and Representative George Miller, who chaired two of the three crucial committees. What does that do in terms of your concerns about the stability and long-term success of the law when you see so many of the key champions who made it happen say, I'm done, it's time for me to retire? Well, some of these folks were extraordinarily effective legislators. I, I think of Henry Waxman. I, I can't think of anyone, perhaps with the exception of Ted Kennedy, who had such an exceptional role in, in, in promoting legislation. So does it scare you when he says, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving? Well, we need, to, we, we, need to get, we need to have this next generation uh -huh. of leaders uh, equally adept. And um, I, I think in, 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 in the Senate Help Committee that you uh, served and the staff of, I, I think we're going to get some good leadership. I think there's a good chance Patty Murray is going to be the chair of the committee, and I think she's going to be an excellent chair. Um, Senate Finance Committee, um, that's going to be an interesting succession. I think Ron Wyden is likely to be the uh, chair of the uh, Senate Finance Committee. Uh, I've, I've known Ron for a, a long time. He's a very creative person, um, and, and he's a very smart guy. Um, and he likes to work across the aisle. Uh, so who knows? Uh, uh, Senator Wyden may turn out to be a significant uh, leader. Uh, there's a big battle as to who's going to be the ranking minority member in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, but I, I, I don't think you can replace Henry Waxman. Henry Waxman, to me, was such an extraordinary person. And, and what is incredible about Henry Waxman is he always had the best staff on Capitol Hill. I mean, the people who served on Henry Waxman's staff really are, you know, have, have served in such formidable capacities even when after they left. Phil Shalero is now uh, leading in the White House the efforts of the White House to try to make sure the Affordable Care Act was, uh, is being implemented effectively. He came from Henry Waxman. You can go down a list of Lots of people. It is a loss seeing uh, Waxman leave the House. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you expect health reform to be a, the ACA, Obamacare, to be a significant part of the conversation in 2015 and 16 leading up to the next presidential election? And can you think ahead to how you think it might play into the national conversation during that crucial period of those two years? 
Well, uh, uh, first we'll start with 2014. I, okay. I, I would say uh, in 2014 it is going to be a significant issue. Republicans have decided to make it a significant issue. We're already seeing lots of ads uh, um, that are uh, that have been placed uh, on vulnerable incumbents. Uh, and so 2014, the Affordable Care Act, is going to be a significant part of the political debate. I don't think it is in 2016, uh, because by 2016, we're going to have so many millions of people covered. I don't think it's a good thing for a Republican member uh, um, to say to constituents uh, or to say to, to, to voters he or she is trying to reach out to, I'm going to take this coverage away from you. You're going to lose your Medicaid uh, coverage, your, and in particular, you're going to, are you going to lose your subsidies for people up to 400 percent of poverty? I mean, 400 percent of poverty. That's $94,200 in annual income for a family of four. That's $46,000 for a person living alone. This reaches fairly significantly into the middle class. And so I think the debate in 2016 is going to be very different than the debate in 2014. Uh, in 2016, one of the issues that may be, uh, that may be significant um, actually will relate to children. And that's because uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program, major accomplishment of Senator Kennedy and Senator Hatch uh, in 1997, uh, there's a very peculiar status of the Children's Health Insurance Program. It is authorized through 2019, but it is funded only till September 2015. And uh, I think there's a high likelihood that uh, uh, Republicans are not going to see, allow it to be refunded. I think there will be a debate about children's health care. What happens to those kids, 8 million kids right now, in the CHIP program uh, when the CHIP program is no longer funded? What does it mean for the families in terms of when they start going into the exchange and they'll have to pay more in premiums, even with the subsidies, more in out-of-pocket costs, the benefits won't be as great? I wouldn't be surprised if Hillary Clinton is the nominee that she, this is an area where she's going to be very comfortable talking about because her, she's always had a deep interest in children, and children in health care may well be an issue. But I don't think the Affordable Care Act as such will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are almost out of time. We have just a few minutes left. And I'm wondering if, in the end, you might just, for our students here and for students and others who are watching, to reflect on your career and advice and lessons for folks who want to either full-time or as part of their lives make advocacy and forward movement on social and economic justice part of what they do. What advice and recommendations and thoughts might you have to share with folks? Don't focus too much on what happened in the past other than learning from it. Think about the future. Um, you know, um, I, I, I often say that at my age the things I remember most vividly never happened. Uh, uh, but, uh, but it really is important to think about the future, what improvements can be made. Don't feel that any defeat is a permanent defeat. Pick yourself up from the floor and, and continue. And, and when you win something, don't feel it's over either because you've got to protect it and you've got to implement it. So there's a lot of work for all of us to do, and uh, I'm glad that we've got a, a new generation coming in that's going to be uh, really energetic in terms of uh, uh, trying to solve the key problems that still need to be solved. Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, so I just want to mention our next Voices event will be on February 25th with Frank Neonator. We'll be speaking and, uh, and answering questions. And just want to thank Ron for making the trip up from D.C. to be here with us today and to share your experiences and your wisdom. You are absolutely one of the giants of healthcare justice in the United States in this crucial period of time. So thank you for everything you've done, and thank you for sharing your time and thoughts with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs>